Welcome to this Literacy Research Association Research to Practice show. The purpose of these shows is to present research from LRA's Literacy Research Theory, Methods and Practice Journal and to discuss the implications of this research for practice. I'm your host, Sonia Klein, an assistant professor at Illinois State University and a member of the LRA Technology Committee. This show will feature the article, Languaging Everyday Life in Classrooms. Participants are the article's authors, David Bloom, professor at Ohio State University, and Faith Boshoman, doctoral candidate at Ohio State University. Thank you for joining us. So let's begin. Um, central to your article is the practice of languaging. Um, can you begin by explaining what languaging is and why languaging is important? The use of languaging builds on recent efforts of um, dialogic theories of classroom discourse derived from Bakhtin's social uses of languages, languaging. Um, so the shift really involves a shift from monologic theories of language to dialogic theories of language. Uh, so building on this shift, we're thinking about language not as sort of an abstract code or structural system, um, but act, uh, languaging as sort of a continual activity um, that we're engaging in. Um, and so from that sense, languaging really becomes orientational. Um, so we're sort of drawing on Becker's notion of this in our article. So thinking about how uh, people draw on imperfectly bits of remembered texts um, as they sort of engage in this continual inaction with people as they're um, continually in relationship with others. Um, so that's really where we're sort of um, grounding our notion of language in Becker's um, notion there. So thinking about it as sort of an intertwined um, shared performance with people. Yeah, the one way to think about this shift is when we think about language generally, we often think about it as a, as a set of systems that, that you learn, but it's more than a set of systems and a set of structures. It's really actions we take when we're with the other people. We language, we talk, we discuss, we debate, we argue, we use language all the time to make things happen. Um, and as we look more at what we do when we language, um, it's actually quite complex. And not only is it complex, we do a lot of things that we're not even quite aware of, and yet really important things we do through the tone of voice we use and how we say something, when we say something, we may communicate love or hate. We may communicate whether we like someone or don't like someone. We may communicate very sophisticated and important ideas. We may communicate quite simple ideas, all of which are important. And at the same time, we're always communicating with each other. What's our relationship to each other? Um, and it's incredibly important how we do that. And these relationships are key. Um, both Faith and I have been classroom teachers um, in previous lives. And, um, and we, of course, we teach now as well at the university. And as every teacher knows, your relationship with your students is absolutely key mm -hmm. to how well your classroom goes, to how learning goes. And so we language, if you will, these relationships all the time. And, and as any teacher knows, Sometimes if you use just the wrong tone of voice, you can put off a student who all of a sudden is no longer cooperative, no longer feels supported, no longer feels encouraged, right? And it's, the words are right, but the tone wasn't quite there. Or sometimes the tone is there, but the words aren't quite right. And the thing is, and it's so amazing, is that we use, we language all the time in ways that are sophisticated and accurate and communicate these things in quite wonderful ways. And so when we start taking a look at classroom and sort of the ways teachers use language, if you will, how they language their classrooms into being, how they language learning into their classrooms, how they 
language enjoyment and learning in their classrooms. We see absolutely amazing things happen in classrooms. And that's what we're quite interested in. It's understanding how that happens. And it gives us a really different way to think about classrooms, to think about teaching, to think about what it means to assess teaching, what it means to learn to be a teacher. If you will, learning to be a teacher means learning how to talk in a classroom that makes things happen. Absolutely. Now, um, talking about classrooms, um, the, the article, in your, in your article, you analyze uh, a classroom event. Um, can you talk about this event um, and, and your study of this event? Yeah, um, we, we can talk about it. Um, um, this was a um, high school English language arts classroom. This is an absolutely wonderful teacher who was well liked and loved by her students and by the school. She had won several awards for her teaching. Um, it was a great classroom. I, I, I've spent actually several years watching her teach in, in the classroom and learned an incredible amount from it. So one of the assignments the students had was to, um, uh, was to write a story. And they had written the story and um, the teacher had sent it uh, back to them with comments. And the students were sitting in a group of four and I was watching one particular group of four young women who were supposed to share their, their story or their essay, because they were really essays, not stories. But, mm -hmm. And they were to get feedback and ideas from each other and to talk about their stories. And of course, the teacher had written comments for them uh, as well. So I was watching and we were video recording the students doing this. And one of the students um, uh, was talking and she began, and as I was listening to her and then captured on the videotape, she said something to me that was, uh, not to me, to the, to the group, mm -hmm. that was really quite striking. And she did it with a, uh, a lot of heavy uh, emotion uh, at the time. So she was saying, well, I'm going to have to start mine all over again. I'm going to have to redo mine. And she breathed several times, clearly distressed. And, and she was talking what, about it. And then she shifted. And she looked at the other students who she's known for years and years, because they've been in the same school together for years and years. And they're friends of hers. They chose to be in this peer editing group together. And she said, is it ever the case um, that, and I'm not saying it exactly, the word, the exact words are in the transcript, that you, know, you want to be like everyone else because you don't want to be who you really are. Right? And she said it, and there was heaviness in her voice when she said it. And, um, and then she continued on, because that's what I feel like all the time. And so then I was watching how the students responded to her and whether they took that up or just let it sort of hang. Mm -hmm. And one student sort of indicated yes and showed some empathy and sympathy with the way she said yes. But then the other students didn't do that. The other students started taking it in a different direction. Like this is how you might revise your paper so you get a good grade. And all of a sudden, it struck me that something had happened here that was more profound than just the notion of what do you need to do in a peer editing group? How do you revise papers? How do you give feedback? If it was, is how do you be a human being responding to other human beings in this situation? And the other girls didn't pick it up that way. They just let it be. And they started talking about how she could restructure her paper to make it a better story. Mm -hmm. And they do this for about five minutes until they're done. And finally, at the end of it, this, this 
one young woman says, it's all, always so much harder than you think. And it's not clear exactly what she's referring to. So when you start analyzing this and what's going on here, you, you ask yourself some questions. What's the social relationship among them? Why did the, they respond to these things? Why did they not pick up what was a very serious question that this young woman was having about her identity, about who she was, how she felt about herself, who she wanted to be that was clearly on her mind because she had actually moved from the story to an aspect that's related to the story, but, but is certainly of a heavier value. And then why did these other girls who were her friends not pick that up and respond? You know, I, I want to be clear, I'm not blaming them. We're not saying they should have done something different. They were in school, there was a task to do and so forth. And they, so they shifted the frame. And all of this is happening through how they're talking with each other. They were languaging a sense of what it means to be a human being at that time, in that place, in that situation. And there was a sense of alienation that was going on there. The young woman who made this statement was sort of talking about how she was alienated from herself and this was a problem for her. And then the other students didn't respond to that and in a sense doubled down on the alienation that was going on. So all of this raises some very important and interesting questions about languaging in classrooms. Now, I'm, I'm, in addition to this, um, we were also struck, or I was also struck, by some research and some work that Faith had been doing in a first grade classroom. And I'm going to let her talk about that because languaging is not just about um, uh, high school classrooms. Yeah, absolutely. So I was looking at um read alouds in first grade classrooms um, and thinking about read alouds, but also looking across at the social life um, in the classroom and thinking about how is it that this teacher is constructing these moments that are um, really exciting with the students sort of collaboratively, co collaboratively in interaction. Um, and the teacher, you know, during these read aloud, she's sort of proposing um, vocabulary concepts and she's talking about some things that are funny and she's sort of making a bid um, to a particular kind of relationship with the student. She's drawing on pure culture. Um, so she's really thinking about what is funny to a first grade student. Um, and sort of really bringing that into the classroom lesson when it's kind of unexpected for these students. Um, and so, you know, she's saying these funny things and they're sort of looking around at each other and sort of monitoring each other, like, should we laugh at this thing that she's saying or not? Um, you know, and then she says, oh my gosh, that's so funny, you know, and, and when, you know, the child says something that's sort of unexpected and, and then that whole class sort of erupts in laughter, you know, and they're, so, they're doing this, you know, me too, me too, and, and there's this sort of, um, it's emergent, you know, it's really, um, it's really interactive and it's sort of, it, it sort of emerges through this whole body language. Again. Um, so we can't just say it's words, um, but it's gestures, it's tone, mm -hmm. it's language, it's, um, you know, language is sort of broadly conceived. Um, so we think about, you know, what is the meaningfulness of this event? Um, and, you know, these read alouds were the, the kids loved them, you know, they were the most sort of important and loved part of the day for these children. Um, so in these read alouds, there was so much care that was going on. And I think that they felt, um, they felt loved in them and they also felt really intellectually alive. Um, and so, you know, thinking about what are the frames and what are the ways in which as researchers, we language these events. Um, thinking about how, how are we languaging this and what are sort of the ways in which we're looking at this um, and also the language that we have available to us. Um, and I think a lot of the language that we draw upon um, in educational research really emphasizes individualism. And so that's where we're really thinking about this construct of relationships mm -hmm. and how can we sort of um, foreground relationships as a part of language. Um, that's where we really think about drawing on Buber's notion of relationships. So he really talks about the I as sort of fun or subverting the I as a fundamental aspect of identity. So for Buber, there is no I, um, that we're always engaged in relationships. Um, so he has these two heuristics, I, thou, and I, it. And so we're constantly oscillating between I, thou, and I, it. And so he theorizes I, thou as 
relationships that are really engaged in mutuality and sort of a connectedness. You bring your whole self to these relationships. Um, and I, it are really um, objectifying and sort of alienating. Um, and it's not that I, it are bad or that they're, um, you know, sort of evil in a sense or that they're wrong, but that we sort of need I, thou, and I, it to sort of get through life. Um, and so the question just becomes, is there an oscillation? Um, that we, we oscillate through these throughout our lives um, and looking for that oscillation. Um, so in this sense, alienation, we're, we're sort of termed that as the objectified and nominalized person, sort of a, conceived as uh, separate from their relationships with other people. Um, and we continually do that in the classroom. We sort of look at children as if they're separate from any other relationship from other people. When continually in language, we're engaged in this collaborative and active performance that we're continually sort of dependent on, uh, on another person to, you know, say the next utterance or to raise the next question or, you know, when I'm done talking, you're going to ask the next question or, you know, so we're continually engaged in this, but we act as if it's, it's, it doesn't exist that way. So obviously, languaging is something really important. It's something we want everybody to be aware of. And as you've been talking today, you've, you've really touched on a number of important implications for practice. But as we, as we finish up, let's see if we can make those implications really explicit um, for the various stakeholders, for, for teachers, for, for students, for policymakers, and, and for researchers. Let's, you know, let's really um, look at those, those practical implications. Well, let me start by talking first about implications for teacher education. Mm -hmm. Let's start there. We have this notion that teacher education is about teachers learning a best practice, or learning a principle or rules, or uh, learning some theoretical principles and then go out and apply them. Mm -hmm. Well, there's nothing per se about that that's, uh, that is um, not necessarily uh, worthwhile. It may be the case that we might want to start thinking of, of looking at teacher education a bit differently. Looking at teacher education more as a process of learning how to use language, or if you will, languaging, within a particular set of situations, right? And in some sense, it's not so much a situation with, let us lay out for you all of the set of principles, now learn these principles and go apply. <laughs> Instead of that kind of situation, we may want to think about a more case-based oriented teacher education where we're looking at cases of the use of language in teacher education. So for pre-service education, it may be studying actual lessons that are being taught by teachers to looking at how they're using language. Just the way, say, a chess master might look at an actual game that had been played uh, by two other chess masters and trying to understand what was going on moment by moment as it evolved, building up, if you will, a knowledge of teaching analogically rather than building up knowledge deductively or inductively. Mm -hmm. And that sort of abductive and analogic teacher knowledge is what then comes to play as teachers go out in their classrooms. And for in-service, it might be better than thinking, okay, let me go learn a whole new set of theoretical principles or scripts for best practice or something of that instead for teachers to video record themselves in their classrooms mm -hmm. and to take those in and with others and with people who have some insight about the nature of language start talking about how are teachers and students languaging that classroom languaging learning into being and what kind of learning and what kind of knowledge and what kind of social relationships are they languaging and once again the sort of abductive case-based knowledge as opposed to sort of the inert set of principles and um, scripts that might otherwise be taught. So one implication here is for teacher education. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I think we can also talk about implications for classrooms and for teaching um, as, as well. And I think the first thing to do is to do away with the split between the affective and cognitive domains, as if human beings sometimes, somehow or other were split down the middle between one side and the other. Human beings come to us whole and complete and integrated. There's no real separation between the affective and the cognitive and the kinesthetic. Those are all heuristics that were for another time and another philosophy. Mm -hmm. but rather, we might think of human beings as whole and we ask, might ask this question, how can we help through how we are using language? Students become agentively and actively involved, not just what they're learning as a discrete set of facts or stories or things that they have, but how can they actually engage in the worlds in which they live and will live? How can we get them connected to that? So for example, some time ago, I was watching a teacher teach a lesson uh, using Sterling Brown's poem, After Winter. And in that poem, there are uses of African-American language, what some people call African-American vernacular English or African-American dialect. And the teacher got the students to talk about those uses. But in getting them to talk about it through her questions, through her back and forth with students, she got them to talk about their uses of language, uses of language that she heard others do, how they use language at home, how they use language in the community, what they saw language used in other places, got them to challenge their own thoughts and myths that they held about language and language use and so forth. The students were fully engaged, not so much because they wanted to learn what were the five points I need to know about the story for the test, but rather they were engaged because it was meaningful for them as they became more and more so engaged in the worlds in which they lived. They left that room talking and debating and arguing with each other about the nature of language variation as they were leaving. It would have been equivalent to what a, a college sociolinguistics course on language variation might give right? But here they were, seventh grade students, and they couldn't give up the topic, even leaving the room and out into the hallways. That's what we mean by languaging a relationship, not only among students, but between students and the worlds in which they live. Okay, do you want to talk about implications, too? Yeah, so I think that it's, it represents really a major shift in language instruction. So thinking not about how are we learning about language in classrooms, but how do we think about creating opportunities for students to experience and enact language. So thinking about something like being silly in the classroom or engaging in verbal play becomes really quite important um, because of thinking about what's the meaningfulness of, of that and how the relationships or what kind of relationships can sort of evolve from sort of enacting that kind of language. Bakhtin uh, in the in sort of his talk about the carnival talks about new modes of interrelationship um, that can emerge through laughter um, and thinking about sort of going after that sort of notion of you know if we're engaging in this sort of collaborative connection through um, sort of how we're you know using this shared experience of language i think that that's really powerful absolutely absolutely um do you want to talk about possibly what this means for, for policy makers? Is that a... Uh... Well, I, I think there are um, a, a couple of things here that's, that strike me mostly about policy makers. And here, I think, guess we're talking about those people who allocate resources to schools, those people who think about accountability for schools and classrooms, and those people who think about how, how to um, uh, organize classrooms and curriculum and so forth. So policymakers is actually a, quite a, a, a lot of different kinds of people come under the role, role of policymakers, including classroom teachers themselves who often, who make policies for their classrooms mm -hmm. um, and so forth. The first thing would be a question, do, do teachers have the resources and the organization and the uh, material situation they need in order to engage students 
in languaging? Or are those resources and the situations they're providing ones that inhibit it? If you have a classroom of 35 or 40 students, it takes a lot of creativity and imagination to figure out how one can engage them uh, with, a, um, with using language to do all sorts of sophisticated things uh, in such a sm uh, with such a large classroom, particularly if you don't have much space in that classroom. We've all been in classrooms where we've seen rows and rows of desks from the front to the back and from side to side, and there's no room to move. So one has to ask if material, the kind of education that really helps students um, uh, engage with the worlds in which they live, including the academic worlds in which they live, mm -hmm. can be provided that, except at the most superficial level. So that's one of the things. The second thing has to do with how we think about and want to assess language itself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure knowing parts of speech actually helps you a great deal in thinking <laughs> about language. Um, I'm absolutely sure diagram helps you learn nothing. Um, and, and, and so forth and so on. To the degree that we think that language is something that you can nominalize and turn into a set of products that you can assess, that you can give, I think misses the point about languaging altogether. Languaging is something people do with each other. And teachers' understanding of languaging and their ability to help students and give students models of ways to do that, to engage in the world and to create relationships that are more empathetic or relationships that reflect more of Boober's understanding of the I-thou relationship rather than the I-it relationship, I think requires um, particular kind of resources uh, for teachers to do that and particular kinds of opportunities. Um, and some of that has to do with how much time is in a class period. If you've got 45 minutes and a huge amount to cover, how are you going to do that? I think it's really hard. And then, of course, there are the tests. Right? One of the issues with our tests is that they put a premium on inner knowledge and the teaching of inner knowledge. And once you do that, it's as if you have defenestrated the language altogether from the classroom. So we need to think about assessment in different ways than the ways we're thinking about it now, particularly now that we're moving to an economy and a social situation in which the exchange uh, of people with each other and relations to each other, both in work situations, community situations, and all sorts of social situations is key to, to any kind of thought of progress. It's not about people, isolated individuals. It is about being with each other and doing things with each other, academic things, mm -hmm. as well as all kinds of other things. So I think those are some of the things policymakers might want to keep in mind all along that, you know, whether it's policy in terms of how much money are we providing to policy and how much time are we making available for teachers to work, be with their students. I think those are some of the things they might want to think about. Thank you. Um, and then finally, perhaps we can bring it back to research and the, the implications for, for practice in research. Yes. Do you want to? Yeah, share I, think, that? I think one of the things with um, in thinking about language and languaging, we're thinking about not only sort of the languaging that goes on in the classroom, but with the linguistic turn in the social sciences, we're also thinking about the language that researchers use um, as they language research. Um, mm -hmm. So thinking about how this language of research also impacts the languaging that goes on in the classroom. So thinking about, you know, part of our work with languaging is actually thinking about how do we come up with um, concepts and language, keep going back to this word language, but how do we, you know, think about a language to describe this sort of um, centrality of relationships in the classroom um, and thinking about, you know, from this research, you know, sort of our next step is to really think about, you know, how do we, how do we sort of think about ways to describe this um, that are really meaningful and substantive for classrooms. Let me uh, add on to that a, if you will, a warning. And, and, and the warning has to do with how our field tends to take things and distort them 
by quantification or by regulation. Languaging, the languaging we all do, is not something you can divide into and check off in neat little ticky boxes. As if we can say, well, you did so many of these and so many of those, and therefore this is good or not good enough and so forth. It really requires a much more fluid understanding of language, its situatedness and how it's situated in a particular place at a particular time and the particular cultural processes surrounding it and running through it. And therefore, does not lend itself to the sort of checkboxes that uh, we often see uh, in research that distorts the fundamental concepts that one might be talking about. Wow, you've given us a lot to think about today. <laughs> Certainly a lot to think about. Um, I'd like to, to thank you, our guests, David Bloom and Faith, Faith Bushman, for discussing your article, Languaging Everyday Life in Classrooms. Uh, you can find this article in the 2016 Literacy Research Theory, Methods and Practice Journal. Um, we're delighted that you watch this Research to Practice show and you can access other Research to Practice shows on LRA's Literacy Research YouTube channel. Uh, thank you from the Literacy Research Association. Thank you. Thank you.